Hey everyone, welcome to week four, Audio Coding with Super Collider. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, let me know if you're out there. Should have two channels of pink noise. Morning, Cody. everybody. Cool. All right. Two things I want to talk about today. First thing I want to talk about is filters. We're going to spend relatively less time on filters because I think they're pretty straightforward. And once you get the basic idea about filters, uh, it's pretty easy to kind of experiment and browse through the filter UGENs on your own and kind of find what you like. And then for the rest of the hour, we're going to talk about uh, working with uh, uh, pre-recorded audio files, basically samples, because we've been doing a lot of synthesis, we've been doing, you know, noise, sine waves, sawtooth waves, etc. So I want to uh, talk about the flip side of the digital creative process, talk about uh, audio files and how to work with them in SuperCollider. So uh, let's bring back our pink noise, actually. And we will start with some stereo pink noise. And I've quit the server for some reason. All right. All right. And am I correct that we have sound? It's, it looks like we do. All right. <coughs> All right. So we're going to go to browse and we're going to go to UGENs and filters. In my library here, I've got. Apparently 126 filter unit generators. And you can then refine your search here. But I'm just going to uh, see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Uh, I think we want linear. Linear filters. And there's four filters I want to talk about. Uh, they are uh, LPF, HPF, BPF, and BRF. So yeah, these are just simple three character all caps unit generator names, which are low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, and band reject filter. Um, so I, I, I imagine some of you are partially or completely aware of how these filters work, but uh, a low pass filter passes low frequencies and rolls off high frequencies. A high pass filter does the opposite. A band pass filter uh, passes a, a single band uh, continuous band of frequencies while rejecting everything above and below. And band reject filter is kind of the opposite of band pass filter, where it will reject a band of frequencies and pass frequencies on either side of the band. So just to uh, see and hear what we're doing here, uh, let's get the freak scope. And we're going to make this more visible. Uh, let's put it, let's just cover up the, uh, well, as soon as I click on this, it's going to disappear. So we'll make some extra space up above. And just for fun, meters and scope. So we should have our pink noise. And there it is. So unlike generators, which uh, you know, you just give them sort of frequency, amplitude, et cetera. Uh, processing unit generators like filters uh, require an input signal, right? What's the signal that we're going to filter? And that's almost always, I think in every case, the first argument. So we're sort of declaring SIG, we're defining it as some sound source, and then we're working with it by, you know, saying, okay, SIG is now a low pass filter version of itself. LPF needs a cutoff frequency. And uh, this is where I think it's, it, we're going to get out in front of this. And uh, it's very important to be aware that many digital filters, probably a great majority of them, are defined with some sort of recursion or feedback in their algorithm, which is what allows them to cancel and reinforce certain frequencies, which means uh, they can explode. Exploding filters, it's really something you want to avoid. And the main way to accidentally explode a filter is to give it bad values. So for example, this cutoff frequency 
you really want to make sure it stays between 20 and 20,000. I do not recommend going outside of that range. And if you're extra cautious, you could even sort of creep inwards a little bit, maybe keep it up to 18,000 and drop it down to 25 or 30 or something. If you get too close to zero, or if, heaven forbid, you give it a negative cutoff frequency, you can almost guarantee that you're just going to you're just going to get some horrible, crazy sound and explosion. So um, I'm just going to urge you to mind your values, work with uh, the, you know, with your system volume muted, or um, you know, just, just take the headphones off. Just be careful. So uh, if we say uh, 10,000, and we'll just, uh, we'll just run this. I'm just going to very quickly run this in command period a few times. So that is definitely a low pass filter. And just for extra clarity, let's mouse exit. So mouse X, I think we've seen this already this semester. A mouse X is a unit generator that takes the horizontal position of the mouse and maps it onto a numerical range as a unit generator. So we can say, let's go from 30 to 18,000. And I, w I would like to do an exponential mapping here. So we're going to set the warp to be 1, which is exponential, uh, instead of 0, which would be linear. And now we're going to pull the mouse X values as well. So we can see them in the post window. And just to be, to really reinforce the modularity of building UGen functions, we can say sine osc uh, dot kr. Uh, we'll give it a one hertz and we're going to say exp range 30 to 18,000. And so take up you know, if you're re-watching this, you could pause the video here and just try to imagine what it's going to sound like or just think in your heads what we're going to hear. We've got a 1 hertz sine wave ranging 30 to 18,000, which is being used to control the cutoff frequency of a low-pass filter. Or maybe something a little more mild. And we have the essence of wobble bass right here. So low pass filter, uh, we could just as easily swap this out with a high pass filter. Um, so this would sound like this. And bringing back our extreme range, maybe slowing it down a little bit. So that's our high pass filter. Just for fun, let's change our sound source. Um, maybe we'll use some good style here and comment this out and keep it as uh, just in case we want to come back to it rather than actually deleting it. So I'm going to do a stereo uh, sawtooth wave. I'm going to scale the amplitude down a little bit. And it's a stereo wave with a little bit of binaural beating going. So the left speaker is 40 hertz, the right speaker is 41 hertz. Kind of an interesting sound. And let's just play it without the filter for a minute. Yeah, so it's got a lot of high energy. You can see in the spectrum over here. It's really quite buzzy. Maybe we'll, I don't know, it's a little unpleasant for my taste. Anyway, sawtooth waves are very rich, very high frequencies in the uh, upper harmonics. So let's go back to our low pass filter. And we will do this. I guess, and maybe even slower. Let's see if I can straighten out this scope here. Yeah, that's nice. So you can really see the uh, the difference, the sort of binaural beating, the different frequencies in the left and right channel. And you can see how the filter operates on the spectrum as well as the waveform shape. Yeah, okay. Um, let's do a bandpass filter. Now the bandpass filter requires an additional argument. I'm gonna space this out so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, I guess it doesn't require an additional argument, but it you have the option of specifying a value called RQ. And remember, this is a bandpass filter, so we have the input signal, 
this is the center frequency of the band. So we're going to be centering on, let's say, 100 hertz, going up to a center frequency of 5,000 hertz. And then RQ is um, the, uh, it stands for reciprocal quality. Normally, well, I don't know about normally, but in most cases, we talk about the um, quality of a band pass filter or a band reject filter in terms of its quality. Uh, and a quality of one is the, uh, the broadest or widest possible band. And then as the quality increases, so let's say, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, the width of the band gets narrower and narrower as it's sort of approaching an infinitely small band as the quality approaches infinity. In Super Collider, we specify this value as the reciprocal of that value, so RQ. Um, this, I believe this is done because it saves uh, a division operation, so it's slightly more efficient than specifying quality directly. So RQ values should, uh, they can be as high as one, and they're supposed to be between zero and one, but never equal to zero. Uh, so um, uh, we could say a quality of one here, and let's just delete this stuff. Maybe do this. Uh, so this is gonna look something like this. Yeah, and you can so it's you can sort of see the um maybe it's a little bit easier with pink noise. We can bring that back. Cool. Welcome to the stream, A Marsh. So that's our bandpass filter. And let's increase the quality by lowering the RQ value. So we'll cut it in half. And cut it in half again. And let's make it really, really low. So we've really, really filtered out a ton of the sound. We have this very narrow band. Uh, I'm going to um, multiply this by five arbitrarily to try to compensate for all of the lost energy from that filter. Maybe even 10. And let's just mouse uh, X this. So we'll say 0 0.01 to 1 exponential mapping. And now we can look at the reciprocal quality value in the post window. And I, I'm going to leave it to all of you to uh, experiment with band reject filter. The concept is very much the same. The arguments are the same. We have an input signal. We have a center frequency for the rejected band. And we have an RQ value for how narrow or wide that band is. Uh, and uh, you, you can open up your scope and frequency analyzer to see how that works. Just I'm going to reinforce this one more time. I'm begging you, don't give your filters bad values. You'll you'll cry, you'll cry so many tears, um, and it'll hurt your ears. So, frequency values between twenty and twenty thousand, um, uh, and uh, RQ values can be one uh, or less, but not equal to zero or less than zero. Uh, narrow band on noise is a very distinct pitch element. Is there any particular waveform that it resembles the most? I would say a sine wave, because a sine wave's uh, spectrum is just itself. It's its own fundamental with no harmonics. And with a bandpass filter, we're sort of narrowing in on a band. So as we um, as we get really really close, uh, let's let's just heart. Let's just limit this to one thousand hertz. Uh, band pass filter. It would have been really loud if we did a band reject filter. Because we would have been rejecting this sort of single tone, uh, but uh, you know, sort of keeping everything else. So, What I will sometimes do, here's a little trick with bandpass filter, is um, well, let's just declare an argument for RQ. We'll set it equal to 0.5 by default. Uh, you'll notice that if we if we keep everything else the same but lower the reciprocal quality closer and closer to zero, we just lose all this uh, amplitude, and so it kind of makes sense to compensate for that uh, if if we if we want to keep 
roughly the same level. So what I will do here is I'll say one over the square root of the reciprocal quality. So if the quality is 0.5, then one over the square root of 0.5 is 1.4. And if the quality is really, really low, like um, the reciprocal quality is like one over 100, then this is a value of 10. And I found that this, this math compensates very nicely for the uh, reciprocal quality. In fact, let's do, um, let's do a variable for RQ. And we'll say mouse x uh, from uh, 0 0.01 to 1 exponential mapping. And I'm just going to double check my code here because I do not want to blow up this filter. Um, so we got mouse x is the RQ, and that's plugged in right here. And we've got this math for the mul argument. Note that we could also just um, multiply by this value. That would, all, that would be the exact same thing. I, I'm just in the habit of doing it here. Um, OK, so let's do this. And now as I move the mouse and change the reciprocal quality, you will notice that the amplitude uh, kind of stays mostly the same. So we get our, you know, honing in on a, on a sine wave here. Let's lower this even more. So over to the left here, it really kind of starts to look like a sine wave with just a little bit of noise scattered around it. Okay, so that's that's a low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, band reject filter. Um, I think let's move on to um, sound files because there's a lot to talk about there. Um, you might also want to check out right before we move on uh, RLPF, which is a resonant low pass filter. It's a lot like LPF. You provide an input signal, you provide a cutoff frequency, and then you can also provide an RQ value, which behaves just like the RQ values we just saw. Um, it's, it basically allows you to add some resonance at the cutoff frequency while also rolling off uh, frequencies above the cutoff frequency. And there's also resonant high-pass filter, which is the opposite. Okay, so I've got, um, yeah, no problem. I've got on, on my desktop, uh, let's get out of here and make some space for ourselves. I can bring that back if anyone wants to see that real quick. Uh, I have... Uh, eight sound files, and I think if I, uh, I've got a, a flute key click, uh, a sustained flower pot, a flutter tongue, glass bottle, prayer bowl, a PVC pipe, a snare drum roll, and uh, a uh, percussive rattle. And I think if I, if I play those from the desktop, I'm going to hear them, but you're not because of the way I have uh, OBS set up. So instead, let's just get right to it and load them into Super Collider. So uh, let's just do this in the, the sort of simplest way where I'm going to say b equals buffer dot read. And we can help file command d on buffer. This is a long help file. Uh, there is a lot of good information in it. Um, remember that you can always find something. Like if you want to know something about the duration, say duration, and I don't know, press keep pressing enter and we'll scan for that. So if you're looking for something specific, remember we do have this, this search bar up here. but yeah, so we'll. This is a lot of good information packed into this into this uh, help file here. So buffer.read, I usually provide two things: um, the server on which to read the buffer, uh, which is our local host server, so we can just say s, and an absolute str a string representing the absolute path to the sound file. We can even go down to the read method if we can find it. Yeah, buffer.read server path. So path is a string representing the path of the sound file to be read. Now, uh, you might initially think, oh, oh man, this sounds so tedious, right? We have to like go, okay, what is the path to, let's do this, um, uh, let's do this prayer bowl. So I guess we can like get info on that and like maybe we can find the path somewhere here. Ugh, you know, it's like on the desktop and blah, 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 blah. Much easier way to do this. Okay, here's what we do. Click on it once and Command C or copy. So normally we'd be copying this file, but 
if we paste into Super Collider, and I think this works for other text documents as well. We're just going to hit Command V or go Edit Paste. And there's the absolute path as a string, which is very, very convenient. So we can close that semicolon and shift enter on this line. And this is what we sort of expect to see in the post window. Um, if we had misspelled this somehow, like with an extra L, uh, then we'd get something like this. No such file or directory. So spelling counts, capitalization counts, but copy and paste kind of takes care of all that. So. Uh, yeah, buffers are server objects, which means if the server is has been quit or is not is not active, this isn't going to do anything because reading this buffer actually involves sending a message from the language to the server that says, "Hey, here's a file loaded into your memory." And the quickest way that we can test these files uh, after reading them into a buffer is just say the instance of the buffer dot play. All right, and this is, um, you can see that there's a uh, activity on the on, on bus zero, but not bus one. I'm gonna hit command period, It's kind of a long file. In fact, this is a good uh, uh, segue. Uh, is there any reason to have a different value for server? Uh, usually no, I mean, as long as you're just making music, making sound on your own computer, then you just always sort of use the local instance of, of the server, which is available to you. Cases where you'd um, provide a different value here uh, is one of the main ones I can think of is if you are in a sort of laptop ensemble situation where one player is the server player. Uh, so there's one instance of a server booted uh, and everyone else is just sort of client players. So they're sending OSC messages to that computer over a network, in which case those client players would have to say like my server equals server dot new, blah, 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 and sort of you know provide the address of that computer and that sort of stuff. But as long as you are the client running the server, then you just provide s or server.local. So. Okay, so we can play, this, play the uh, buffer like this, and we might want to know some things about the buffer, like how many channels does it have, right? Is it mono or is it stereo, or is it some exotic multi-channel file? How long is it? Uh, what sample rate was it recorded at? So we can do a bunch of querying things like uh, b.duration. So this is a 28.25, et cetera, second file, um, be it at num channels. It's one, so it's a mono file. Uh, let's see, b.sample rate. So this, this particular sound was recorded at a sample rate of 44,100 samples per second. Um, we also might want to know how many samples are in it. So we could multiply duration by the sample rate. Or we could also just say b dot num frames. So this is how many individual samples are in this file, and I'm gonna briefly just open this up in Audacity, and let's just take a look at this file here. So I'm just gonna zoom in until we see the samples themselves. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in Super Collider, let's uh, make this a little bit more visible. Uh, this is, uh, frame zero. This second dot here is frame one, frame two, three, four, etc., all the way up to one million and something, whatever it was, right? So it's all those individual samples. Uh, the reason we call these frames and not samples, is it's a little subtle. It's, um, not the most important thing in the world. Um, but like, for example, uh, if we were to open this flute flutter file, so I'm going to copy this. Oops, and we need to say buffer.read s and then the string. And we can say, uh, whoa, um, c dot uh, num frames. And it's got a different, it's a shorter file. We can, might as well play it. So uh, C dot number of channels is um, two. So this is a stereo file, and open this up in Audacity. So it's uh, it's two channels. It's stereo, so we have 
uh, basically twice as many samples as if this were a mono file. So Super Collider sees um, this as the first frame, this, this sort of pair of dots. So in a stereo file, we have twice as many samples as frames. Um, you know, we have 200,000 frames, but a total of like 400,000 samples. It's a subtle difference. Uh, generally, in Super Collider, we find ourselves referring to frames because we just want to know, you know, what all of the samples at this particular vertical frame. Frame, 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 frame. Yeah, that, that sort of idea. All right. But let's, let's, uh, this, this playing method is really, it's kind of useless other than just confirming that the file was correctly loaded and that it's working. And, um, uh, bef there are, this is kind of like the sloppiest way to uh, uh, to read files into memory. I mean, the naming convention is just abysmal. I mean, B and C. <clears throat> I'm just I use B because it's B for buffer, and then I just go C D E F G. That's just because I'm really lazy. We should really do something like um, you know prayer bowl, and at the very least, you know flute flutter. Um, maybe you want to do something a little bit shorter, but you know it's good to it's good to do something that is you know kind of meaningful so that you actually know what you're working with when you're typing code um but even this is kind of um you know there's a, there's a better way which I want to get to at the end of the lecture but uh for now I I want to talk about one of two um buffer reading ugens and the first one is play buff capital P capital B and the other one which we might get to is buff read capital B capital R B U F R D these uh, both basically do the same thing they uh, produce a signal by reading sample values stored in a buffer um, the way they go about it is slightly different so um, let's begin with play buff we're gonna say X equals do I have something down here what was that about do I have an open no, I guess not. Okay. Uh, play buff dot ar, and play buff needs a variety of things. It needs the number of channels of the buffer that it's going to be playing, and this value can't be modulated. So it's not possible to declare an argument at the beginning for number of channels and then sort of dynamically change it, um, you know, from one to two to four or whatever, because the number of the number of uh, channels in a buffer is fixed, right? You can't, uh, it's, it's not something that's subject to real-time variation, right? Like these, you know, any, any of these uh, files here, they just have a fixed number of channels and that's not gonna change. So uh, in fact, if we were to try to put an argument here instead of a hard number, uh, I think we'd get an error message. So uh, we need to ask ourselves, what buffer are we gonna be playing and how many, uh, channels is it so I I'm, I'm inclined to go with this flute flutter uh, it's two it's two channels also I've been kind of doing this a bunch and this is pretty sloppy because it just reads another buffer into memory and makes the previous ones inaccessible it'll still work but you know eventually we'll just have all these buffers sitting around that we're not using and that are inaccessible so sometimes it's nice to do um, uh, buffer dot free all and this will just wipe all the buffers away, and then we can start over and say flute flutter. Um, in fact, I want to call this flute. I might be typing this a lot, and I'm, I don't want all these characters here. So flute, great. All right, so this is, um, uh, if, we, if, we, if we know what file we're going to be playing, we can just put that there, or just say two. I'm going to space this out so we have a little more space. Everybody with me so far? Uh, so the next next one is buff num. Every time you uh, read a buffer onto the server, it is assigned what's called a buff num, which is an integer starting at zero and then just sort of uh, going in order. So when you read your next buffer into memory, it gets buff num one, next one gets buff num two, etc. And this is something which is handled automatically. You can micromanage it if you want, but I never do. I just let the server assign buff nums however it wants. And... Um, uh, you know, so, if, so for now we could say a uh, flute dot buff num, and this one has buff num zero because we did buffer dot free all. But maybe if we were reading like 
all eight files, and this was like the um, you know the sixth one, then it would have buff num five, I guess zero one two three four five. Um, uh, we we can we can do this just if we say which which one we want to play. Let's leave it there for now, and let's before we do anything else, let's just confirm that this works. So we have a sound function which we are playing. We're calling it X, and uh, we are using play buff. Don't need to do this, but I'm going to declare a variable and call it equal, call it sig instead of equal play buff. So two channels loop. Yeah, there's our file. Right. So that's pretty much it. We can uh, let's go to the next argument here, which is rate, and this is a ratio uh, for playback rate, and the default is one, which means play it as is. Um, so let's set it to one and we can play this and then change it and run it a few more times. Actually, I'm going to be a little bit more clear and just run this. Right. Command period. So a value of 0.5 is an octave down. Value of two is an octave up. And then, you know, you can put whatever values you like in there. Uh, you can even make it go backwards, um, although by, by providing a negative number, but this isn't going to work right away because we need to get to the other arguments here. Um, and also, let's look at the node tree. Oh, I hit command period, so I, I, I meant to demonstrate something. But let's just say we do this. Or maybe maybe even this, random... So, all right, there we go. Playbuff is a lot like EnvGen um, in that it has a finite length. It plays a buffer, and that buffer is not an infinite signal. It's It's got a beginning and an end. So at a certain point in time, Playbuff is done. Um, it's reached the end of the file. And like EnvGen, it has a done action argument, which is actually the last one. So we're going to skip ahead to it. And the default is zero, which means do nothing when finished, which is why all of these synths are still hanging around. Um, and, and they're all continuously uh, running, right? They, they're, they're continuously outputting the last frame value or last sample value uh, in, at the end of the buffer, uh, which is uh, you know, probably close to zero. So we don't hear anything. Uh, on the meters, though, ah, look at that. We actually do have a little bit of signal level, just this sort of static DC bias at something like minus 60 or minus 70 dBFS. Um, so yeah, we don't want that. Uh, we can hit command period, and they all disappear. So if we do done action 2, then they will free themselves. You know, whenever they're done. So if you are um, planning to play your sound files in a sort of one-shot fashion, where you just beginning to end and then they're done, done action two makes a lot of sense because you want those gone as soon as they're done because they're finished. All right. So that is uh, number of channels. Uh, the buff num. Um, note that you can also omit buff num, and this will this will still work. So as long as you just provide the name of the buffer instance, that's fine as well. Uh, rate. Let's return this to a value of one. And then we have these two arguments here: trigger and start position. And we also have loop. So let's go to loop first. Loop should be either zero or one. So zero if you don't want to loop. One if you do want to loop. Mm, I forgot a comma. So it's just looping, yeah. Very easy. And if we make this faster. Still loops. Uh, and and when loop is one, playbuff ignores its done action. Because when it's looping, it's never done. 
So there's no reason to check that on action. But if it's zero, as soon as play buff is on its last frame, it will check its done action and do the action associated with that number. All right, uh, and so this is actually how we make it go backwards. If we set loop to be one, then we can say negative one for rate. All right, and uh, the reason this doesn't work, the, re the reason this didn't work before is because loop was zero, uh, which meant we start, um, the default is zero, so we start on the zeroth frame, and the rate is negative one, so it moves backwards. Uh, so the very first um, frame, it uh, no, I think I think the re it's because loop is zero, and so it 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 sees the the boundaries of the buffer, the sort of first and last frame, as this sort of hard wall, and so it tries to go backwards and says, oh, right, I guess I'm done, right? And so it just stops right there. So we don't hear anything at all. But if we set loop to one, then we can imagine sort of taking the end and beginning of the buffer and sort of linking them together to form a, a circle. All right, and then the uh, the last, let's turn loop off, let's do that. Let's make playback one again. And um, so trigger and start position. Uh, start position, let's just say one for trigger for now. And start position is a value in frames where playback should start. So if we want to, st I mean, you know, what are we going to sort of guess? Like, I guess we b dot num frames. This is it's this many frames. So what frame do we want to start at? Well, it's, it's kind of, I find it very tedious and, and weird to think in terms of frames. But uh, if we just want to start halfway through the file, we can just say num frames times 0.5. And that gives us this value. And I think, I think it automatically truncates this number. If it happens to be like, uh, we got some weird ratio here. I think it's going to give you frame 702478 in this case and just ignore. I'm not sure exactly what it does, but it doesn't blow up or anything. Uh, so this will start halfway through the file. And... Ah. <laughs> B does not exist anymore, right? Because I did buffer.free all. There's nothing there. See, I just, I'm just bad habits here. So we need to say flute. That's the buffer we're working with. Or we could start 85% of the way through. And then we can say maybe um, random rate between 0.5 and 1.5. Right. And then tr this this one, trigger, uh, is basically when, when a trigger is received at this uh, value, it causes a jump, an immediate jump to the start position. And with a hard value of one here, it's not possible to re-trigger this. It sort of it triggers immediately, and then it's it's never off. So we could make a uh, an argument. We'll call it t underscore trig. Remember, uh, these t underscore type arguments are useful when you're dealing with triggers. So we'll say t underscore trig. And we'll turn done action to off. We'll get rid of that because uh, this way we can actually re-trigger it. Now if we had done action two here uh, and, and loop is off as it is right now, then it would work once and then it wouldn't work anymore because done action two says, mm -hmm. oh, we're at the end, goodbye, and it disappears. So we can try to be like fast enough like this. No, I wasn't fast enough. Maybe I can get it. So I can try to keep it alive, but, you know. Anyway, it gets to the end and it disappears. So if you want to be able to re-trigger, uh, usually done action zero makes sense because otherwise it disappears if it gets to the end. Uh, okay, and then the last thing I want to say about play buff. Uh, let's clean some of this up here. Let's talk about rate one more time. So, this is all well and good, and, and in, and in many cases, just a value of one or, or some argument that you want to provide here. 
um, is fine, but it assumes if if you specify one and you want it to play back as it normally sounds, you are assuming that the sampling rate uh, at which the file was uh, recorded is the same as the sample rate at which the server is running. And in this case, they are the same, which is good. I mean, it's, it, they don't have to be the same, but so this, this flute sample was recorded at 44,100 samples per second, and currently the audio server is running at 44,100 samples per second. So a value of one means just line those samples up, right? Just one sample per sample. Uh, but for example, if we imagine this flute sample was recorded at like 48,000 samples per second or something else, and we specify, and the server is running at 44.1, and we specify a value of one here, then it's going to line those samples up, and uh, effectively the, the 48,000 sample rate audio file is gonna get a little bit stretched out to uh, line up its samples with the slightly slower rate of the server, and as a result, the pitch of that audio file is gonna go down a little bit, and the duration is gonna get a little bit longer, even though we specify a value of one for playback rate. So there's a unit generator called buff rate scale, which uh, is very handy. It, it returns a ratio using these two values, the, the ratio of the server sampling rate and the buffers sampling rate at which it was recorded. Uh, and so this basically guarantees that the, uh, the sound file will play back at the rate that we specify. So now if we do something like this, Everything sounds the same. It's it's working as planned, but this this takes into account circumstances where the sampling rate of the buffer and the server might be different. So this is a good habit to get into. So when you're specifying rate, don't just put the rate, but put the rate times buff rate scale dot kr and then the the buffer there. Um. Okay. And it's, it is also possible to do IR here if you don't plan on dynamically swapping one buffer out for the other, sort of mid mid playback. Um, but KR is still relatively cheap, and I usually just get in the habit of using KR here. Even though we don't we don't technically need a continuously changing signal, we can do IR, which just calculates the value once. Okay, this is is a lot of stuff here. Um, let's let's make a synth def. Just to, to show, th this this is um, just kind of quick sloppy testing here. So let's go ahead and make a synth def. Um, call it, um, yeah, buff is fine, I guess. All right, and let's make some arguments. It's, we want to definitely want an argument for which buffer we're going to play because, you know, we, what we don't want to do is hardwire something like tilde flute into this synth def because then that's the only buffer this synth def can work with. We want to make it more modular. So we'll make a argument called buff, default it to buff num zero. Uh, we'll make a rate argument. We will make, uh, I don't know, an amplitude argument. Set it to one, I guess. Uh, an output argument. And let's just kind of get started here. And this has to be a hard value, this number of channels here. So if you are mixing and matching, uh, you know, uh, hold on, where am I going? Um, if you're mixing and matching mono and stereo files, then probably what you'll need to do is make two synth apps, one for mono files and then another one for stereo files. Uh, I'm just going to work with mono files for now. So I'm going to say one buff, uh, buff rate scale dot kr buff so we're providing the the buffer number here and then we're also scaling the rate appropriately um i guess we could also let's see uh i don't i'm not going to mess with uh trigger and start position but i will say loop we'll make a argument called loop uh, which will be zero by default and uh, done action DA. So we'll provide an argument for our done action as well, just in case we want to change that, but it'll be two by default. 
and uh, sig equals sig times amp. And let's give ourselves the ability to pan this, right? Because it's going to be a one channel play buff. We don't want it just in our left ear. Let's actually provide a um, pan argument and we'll set it to zero so it'll be in the middle and out.ar out sig. There's just a basic synth def. Let's hope this works. Looks good. And uh, let's see, do we, let's load the um, prayer bowl, say bowl um, buff, and we'll say uh, buff. It, nah, this is confusing. I don't, I don't like having this here, like having an argument name, the same as a synth def name. So we'll call it buff play. Oop, there we go. Um, so this is going to be bowl, right? That's our buffer. We can say buff num if we want. We don't have to. Um, and I guess that's fine. Uh, kind of off topic at the minute. Uh, Supercloud handle FFT wavelet transform uh, phase vocoder style processing. Yeah, it does. That is pretty far off topic. Uh, but take a look at um, the FFT um, uh, file, which also links you to FFT overview. Uh, and there's a bunch of examples here. So yes, it does. Um, it's not. It's not something I'm like intimately familiar with, but I have used these before, and I have a general understanding of how it works. But that's a good starting place. Uh, you know, if we wanted, we could put an envelope on this. Uh, you know, just so so it doesn't, we don't have to hear the whole thing. In fact, let's do that. Um, let's do um, zero one zero attack release one negative one done action. Ah, and now we have another instance where we have two done actions, right? So which one of these should be the the uh, the um the the synth ender yeah no problem Arnim uh, and I think it should be the envelope because the envelope might be shorter than the file um, so let's we're gonna change this a little bit and I guess it doesn't really make sense to have loop anymore I'm I'm kind of reconceptualizing how this works uh, so this is always gonna be kind of a one shot deal so we need to make our attack and release um, parameters. And apply the envelope like this. And I forgot a whole bunch of stuff somehow. Uh, all right, hold on. Oh, I just didn't close my, oh yeah, okay. That ought to do it, right. I just didn't finish what I started. Okay, so we've got our envelope, we've got our signal, we're panning the signal, we apply the envelope and an amplitude argument, we send it out. Yeah, and so now we've got this. Uh, it might be nice to start somewhere other than the beginning. So I'm gonna new line this so it's a little bit easier to read. And now I've done it. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I can't do these out of order. The the um these are number of channels, buff num rate. And so I sort of jumped to start position and then tried to pick up where I left off. So I just need to put this here. I'm just specifying start position because I don't want to, you know, I could just put a one here just to get trigger. But I think this is clear because it says we're starting at the start position provided by that argument. So this, this seems to work. And so now we can say um, s pause. Um, bowl dot num frames divided by two or times 0.5, whatever you prefer. So now it's starting halfway through. Yeah, so it's, it's very clear if we start towards the end when it, the sample is already kind of fading out. All right, um, let's do some, ah, you know, I really need to, I do, there's one more important thing I need to show. Uh, 
before we finish up. I don't want to run out of time, but I do want to just, you know, let's say rate um, uh, our RAND 0.52. So now we have, and let's make the release time um, a little bit longer. And I need to close that. Oh, I see. So this this start position is after the percussionist has stopped rolling, I think. So Yeah. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Now let's just randomize this as well. Between 0 and 0 and the number of frames uh times 0.7, I guess. also say amp uh, randomize this a little bit and maybe give ourselves a little bit of an attack somewhere between 0 0.001 and 1 so some of them will fade in some of them won't Okay, and let's quickly look at uh, this rate. So it's you probably are not always going to want to specify the perceived pitch as a ratio, right? So 1.52, it's kind of clumsy. It doesn't always, um, doesn't always, you know, it's not, it's not very intuitive. Uh, let's do, let's go back to num frames times 0.5, um, so halfway through. Yeah. All right, so remember there's MIDI ratio. Uh, so 0 dot MIDI ratio means transpose it by zero semitones. So we can say minus one, minus two. And now we're just going down the keyboard. So this is, if you're thinking in terms of equal temperament to a 12-tone chromatic scale, this is the one for you, right? So. Uh, And you could randomize this as well, right? Let's say somewhere between minus 12 and positive 12. So then we get, you know, uh, from here you can get very creative with your pitches and your amplitudes and sort of make a really nice texture. You can also randomly choose one of your files, right? You can say the bowl, uh, something, something else. Uh, dot choose. Uh, I guess you'd have to also manage start position here, so you might do something like this. Um, and then you would say pitch, pitch right? Because you want it to match. You want to say, I want to play this buffer, and I want to use that buffer to refer to how many frames it has. Um, so you can you can choose from an item in an array. Very, very handy. Okay, so just boop, boop, boop. Yeah, you get the idea. All right. The last thing I want to talk about is, uh, I guess we, we're not going to get to buff read, but I want to I wanna show you a much better way of dealing with loading sound files in. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, make a new folder called project, you know, and in this folder, I'm going to make another folder called sounds, and in that folder, I'm just going to move all of these, and I'm going to save um, this file in that folder as well. So we're going to go to our desktop, and, and we're going to say... Um, live stream code and we're going to put this in project <coughs> uh, right. okay 
So now I've saved that file in project as live stream code. And this is kind of the same idea when you're working in a DAW project where you have a bunch of audio files and other resources and they all really need to live in, uh, in one repository, in one directory, so that if you move it to a new computer or, you know, for example, submit it as a homework assignment for someone else to download and grade, you want all of the audio files to be part of that package because if you're just referring to audio files on, you know, your desktop, then this absolute path isn't going to make any sense. It's not going to point anywhere uh, on somebody else's computer. So the way this is done is, is uh, using a little method called um, now executing path. Um, I really don't have, I, I don't fully understand sort of exactly what this means, nor do I have the sort of time to explain it, but uh, this process dot now executing path uh, returns an absolute path to this super collider code file. Uh, it, this only works after the document has been saved at least once. Um, so once you save it, this line of code will return uh, the, uh, the instance of um, the, the, the absolute path to this file. So if I were to take this, um, this project folder and move it somewhere else, I, I guess we, can, we could do that. You have to I sort of take my word for this. But if I were to drop this into, into this music 407 folder or somewhere else or zip it and email it to you and you unpack it, this line of code would return uh, the absolute path at that point, right? So this, the, this, it would actually change what's returned. Uh, is there a limit to how long these uploaded sample files can be? Uh, I guess. I mean, uh, I've, I've loaded, like, I've done buffer.read on, like, 10-minute audio files, and, it, you know, it doesn't load instantaneously, but it's very quick. I think for, like, hour-long or multiple hour-long files, you want to use, uh, what is it? V dis disk out, I think. Yeah. Maybe not disk out or... Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there is a different UGen which kind of like streams a longer file in instead of loading it all ahead of time. Um, I don't remember um, exactly what it is, but I'm I'm just want to want to stick on this for a second. So the key to using this process that now executing path is um, the relative path of your sounds to your code file is always going to be the same. So we use a um, uh, something called uh, a class called path name and we provide uh, this string so this is now an instance of a class called path name which points to the path to this code file and we can then say give me the the string representing the parent path so this is now users Eli desktop project so that's the the folder that uh, contains this code file and the folder of sound files so then we can say concatenate with the string sounds slash you know whatever whatever this is um, we'll copy that or we'll just we can we can just read it flowerpot underscore uh, dot aiff right so then we can say flower uh, bang right and then just to check that it worked uh, flower dot play and why did that not work. Play not understood. Oh, it's because I didn't read it into a buffer. Okay. Um, so there's there's one last step here, which is to say buffer.read s and then this business. This looks really cluttered. I don't like it. Um, if you wanted to separate this out a little bit, you could say, yeah, I don't know if this is worth it. Yeah, it's just gonna. It's just I just hate when it goes on to the next line. But I'm just trying to make the font big enough. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you all like sort of watch this back and pause it and pick this apart. But we have Flower is an instance of a buffer, and we're reading a buffer onto the localhost server. And this code is a string that represents the path to that audio file. And because we're using this process that now executing path, we're free to move this repository anywhere, and this will always return a path that is correct. So I think this should now work. Yeah, so we've got our, our flower pot. It sounds a lot like the uh, prayer bowl. So then you could you could sort of copy this and you know for your next file you'd say 
uh, bowl, and this would be whatever it is, prayer bowl, I think. Uh, prayer bowl roll, A-I-F-F. -F. So this would be. And now we have bowl. Okay, so hopefully you get the idea. I'm gonna ask all of you who are, who are taking the class with me to use the, the uh, this process that now executing path method for reading buffers into uh, into your code onto the server uh, in your in class and take home problems so that I can download them and theoretically I should just run your code as it is you know you'll be uploading a zip file which is a from a folder so I'll unzip it and I'll get your project I'll open your code and your sounds should be right here in a second file and I guess I'm sort of out of time. Um, maybe I'll try to cover buff read next time. We'll see where the class leads us. But uh, for now, I guess this is a, most about 80 to 90% of what I hope to cover today. So we've got our filters, which you can experiment with. Maybe try uh, sort of adding a filter here, right? So you, you're playing a sound file, and you're filtering it, and then you pan it, apply an envelope. Um, and then the really interesting things happen when you uh, maybe put this synth inside of a routine. Like, uh, is this still going to work? No, I forgot a comma. So instead of manually running this all the time, you can say something like R equals uh, this um, fork and we'll loop this here. Um, make sure to put a wait time here. So we'll say rand.12.wait. And yeah, so now we have a little routine which loops the following code. It plays a synth and then it waits for some amount of time. Okay, sorry. I don't want to just get carried away here, so I, I'm gonna we're gonna dismiss. Uh, that's it for this week. I guess I'll stick around and make a little sound just for fun and answer any questions if anyone's got any. Um, yeah. So technically, no. I there's not an official online course um, associated with class. I just kind of I, I kind of do my lectures on Twitch because um, I like the public aspect of it and. Um, you know, I can just that way I can upload the videos later because it's a lot of material to digest. So I think it's useful for students to be able to rewatch this. Um, but yeah, the actual in class and take home assignments are not publicly available at this time. What I've considered sort of going to the um, my university's sort of teaching and learning center and sort of getting a sense of what would be required if I wanted to make this a proper online course. But for now, it's kind of like a yeah, it's like a flipped course. Um, where you know students watch the lectures online and then do the homework in class and at home. Uh, so you know it'd, it'd be nice, but uh, I also am I'm not sure it would really work as a full-on distance learning class because there's a lot of FaceTime that happens in class and students who might have specific questions and it's just nice to have a, a time when we can all get together in the same room. Um, so yeah, and yeah, there are tutorials on my on my YouTube channel which. Is uh, I've got about 24, 25 of them. Uh, the, oh, and you should all watch tutorial 8 because that one all has to do with buffers. And it's it's a more condensed version of a lot more information. Uh, I think it covers buff read. And, um, you know, it's less improvised. It's much more structured and the flow is, is probably a little bit better. Uh, methods that can be applied to the argument of a synth to clip its value. Oh, yeah, yeah. I should have mentioned that. That's actually really good. So here, you know, you've got your, I'll just put it here, just copy this. Yeah, the method you want is clip. So if we say um, sig equals um, lpf.ar sig, um, like mouse x.kr. Um, if we say like, I don't know, just 20 to 20,000, 
but then you want to actually constrain this in a smaller range, um, you would say dot clip, like 50, uh, 500 to 5,000. And then, uh, did I do this right? Yeah, so the, the frequency is controlled by the mouse, uh, which ranges from 20 over here to 20,000 over here, uh, but then we're clipping it, so it should sound like this. So here we have some, we have a range in the middle, but over here, it doesn't matter where the mouse is, it's past the 500 point, so it just gets clipped to 500. And up here it gets clipped to 5,000. So this, that's actually a pretty safe thing to do. If you ever are not exactly sure your code is right, you can just clip your cutoff or center frequency values to force them inside of that suitable range. I think that's what you mean. No, no, this is, I mean, it, yeah, I guess it, it is a, it's a paid course for students who are taking the real deal, you know, because they're paying tuition and all that. Uh, no, and I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on Twitch and live stream it if I didn't want the public aspect of it. So it's it's kind of open to everyone. Everyone's just kind of here to, and I'll I'll spend time at the end answering questions if anyone's got questions. Uh oh, it's pretty bad. Um, I'm not gonna do it because I I don't trust myself to properly mute everything with my convoluted uh, OBS. Super Collider or audio routing. Uh, w basically, what I wish I had a video. I am gonna make a um a, like a mini tutorial on this at some point. But like, uh, if you let's say, um, where's my, what is the hotkey for the scope? Yeah, like if for example, I mean you can you can do this if you're just like on headphones. Just take the headphones off and like mute your system volume, and then do any of these filters and set the mouse to range between like minus 20. Oh, I guess, and you can't do exponential there. You know, so you just like do do this and take away the clip. I'm not gonna run this. If you're gonna run this code, mute your volume, blah, 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 the whole, the whole shebang. But yeah, it's, you'll see like the, this scope just kind of like turn completely yellow, I think. Like it just kind of shoots up to infinity or something. It's pretty catastrophic. It's pretty alarming. <laughs> It's uh, it's it's one of the main reasons why I've trained myself to kind of constantly be hovering over command period whenever I'm working. Like if you were here in my office, you'd see my left hand is kind of always on command period right here, and it happens to me every now and then. So it's I would I would call it um noticeably catastrophic. It's really bad for your speakers, probably. Yeah, just very like just like ooh, just like blah, just like horrible, horrible, horrible noise. Uh, the super collider sort of use the localhost network protocol to communicate with itself. It does, yeah. It's uh, whenever you say buffer dot read or synth dot new or anything that involves a message between the server and the client, or the, you know the SC synth and SC lang. What actually happens is under the hood, there's a little OSC message that gets sent, and you can actually manually send these messages. It's just that things like synth dot new and buffer dot read are are very readable conveniences for for sending the OSC message. It's like a a more human friendly way of doing it. And yeah, OSC is a is a protocol that basically works over UDP or TCP. Um, and that's the same thing that happens if you're using like multiple computers with multiple clients in one server. Um, yeah, and in fact now, like with the latest version of Mac OS, uh, whenever I try to like uh, send an OSC message from one computer to another, it says, do you want to allow network communication? You know, it's just like someone's trying to send you something uh, do you want to allow it? And so I have to sort of confirm every time I, you know, open up SuperCloud and try to do this thing. So yeah, it's, it, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a network protocol sort of thing. Um, I don't know why it doesn't pop up when you just do synth.new. I guess it's maybe because of the local server. Yeah, yes, please do. Take appropriate precautions. Um, I wanted to clarify the language you're using to... Yeah, right. So it all of this is um so it's all OSC communication. This this help file is more sort of like if you want to explicitly send custom messages to other computers and receive stuff like that. But then there's also um a help file called server command reference which lists in a little bit of a cryptic way the OSC messages that the server understands. Like for example, uh, S underscore new, I think is 
is the address for an OSC message that creates a new synth. And you need to also provide in that message an uh, integer for the synth ID, an add action, uh, a target, the name of the synth def, you know, so it, so it looks something like, um, uh, something like this, where we say, um, I don't know, s.send message, uh, msg, um, s new, um, I guess this, this can be a string or a symbol, um, I don't know, let's say a thousand for the ID, I don't really know. I never do it this way. I I do this way very very rarely. But it is possible to make a synth on the server by explicitly sending the correct OSC message to the server. Are many students using SuperCloud on PC? Some of them are. Uh, I think most of them are on Mac OS. Um. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it is a a fully cross platform. Well, maybe not fully cross platform. There are a few very obscure parts of the uh, the class library that are not fully functional on certain operating systems. Um, I think things like uh, server devices, or no, no, uh, server options, like, uh, yeah, for example, this method is Mac OS only, and there might be some discrepancies on things like serial port and other other classes which sort of have the computer talking with its peripherals and stuff like that, but for the most part, SuperCollider is Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, at least for all of the basic vanilla stuff like synthesis and sampling and filters. Yeah, so it's it's pretty pretty friendly in terms of cross-platform stuff. Just gonna make a little little sound. I forget what I was gonna do. I guess we sort of had this going. Is this still working? Yeah, and then what I wanted to do is like choose from a collection of stuff like I have no idea how this is gonna sound, but you know, let's just try it. We want to choose one of these uh, transposition races and then So it's like wind chimes. Dang, there we go. Kind of. You are welcome. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'll just turn this down for a second. So yeah, I guess that's it for this week. Um, well, fun trivia. Uh, poor units for dust and crackle to... Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah, dust and crackle. Very... Crackle in particular. Very, very interesting uh, noise flavor. Yeah, so as the chaos parameter approaches to, it starts to take on this interesting crackly sound. Yeah, that'd be great to have that on, a, on an analog rack. Oh, I see it's on Reactor. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in here. Um, let's see, Eugen. Oh, we wanted stochastic things. All sorts of brown noise, clip noise, dust, dust blue. Man, there's so many Eugens, and I've used like so few of them. Yeah. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna call it, call it a week, and so anyone who's still out there taking the class, I'll see you on Thursday for another set of in-class problems and a take-home programming set. And uh, yeah, I'll upload this today and uh, more Super Collider same time next week. My pleasure. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, okay, take it easy, everybody. See you next week.